three. Good morning and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. I'm Michael McDonald, Chair of the Mass Casualty Commission. We begin by acknowledging the memories of those who have lost their lives, their families, and all those most affected by this casualty. This loss and suffering must remain the driving force behind all of our efforts. At the outset, we also want to acknowledge that we are joining you today from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Pendant cette période difficile, nous souhaitons que vous prenez soin de vous et de vos proches. Like so many of you, we have had to adjust our way of working with public health measures in place. But if the pandemic has disrupted our lives, it has strengthened our resolve to fulfilling our mandate and doing so in a respectful, transparent and independent way. This morning, we will be sharing the Mass Casualty Commission participation decision, which is the next step following our call for applications for individuals and groups seeking formal participation in the Commission's proceedings. In line with our COVID-19 protocols, our commitment to health and safety, and respecting the province of Nova Scotia's advice that we work from home whenever possible, we are speaking to you today by way of this webcast. Commissioners Fitch, Stanton, and I will read the key highlights from the participation decision. However, we encourage you to read the full decision available by way of the Commission's website, where you can also find information on how to contact the Commission if you have any questions about today's decision or our work in general. In a moment, Commissioner Fitch will provide a summary of the applications we received and our decision for each. Following that, Commissioner Stanton will describe the next steps in our process. But to begin, I will provide a brief summary of our mandate and describe our application process. By joint orders in council dated October 21st, 2020, the governments of Canada and Nova Scotia established this mass casualty commission to examine the April 18th and 19th, 2020 mass casualty in Nova Scotia and to provide meaningful recommendations to help protect Canadians in the future. The goal is to make us safer in our homes and our communities. We are mandated to report our findings and make recommendations by November 2022. Our orders in council already prescribe an opportunity for appropriate participation to the Government of Canada, the Government of Nova Scotia, and victims and families of victims. Therefore, our present task is to grant an opportunity for appropriate participation to others with a substantial and direct interest in the subject matter. We can also recommend that the Clerk of the Privy Council provide funding for those who would not otherwise be able to participate. To complete this aspect of our mandate in March, we broadly circulated a call for applications through a variety of media. Public inquiries such as ours are expected to go beneath the surface and examine the broader context in which the mass casualty of April 18th and 19th, 2020 occurred. In general terms, the order in council direct us to examine the causes, context and circumstances giving rise to the mass casualty, responses by police and other service providers, applicable policies and training for police and other service providers, communication by the police and other service providers with those most affected and the public generally, communications among all the various service providers, the role of intimate partner violence and gender-based violence, access to firearms and the disposal of surplus police equipment. Our commission from the outset has been and will continue to be completely independent from the federal and provincial governments in fulfilling its mandate. We started our work from scratch when the orders in council were issued. Since then, we have independently built our team, secured our offices, 
away from government offices and begun our work. Being independent also means that we have the ability to control our own process and to make rules regarding the procedures that will govern the inquiry. Our independence will continue for the duration of our mandate. It is important to understand that our commission is not a court nor a branch of the judiciary. Instead, public inquiries such as ours are investigative. The function of our commission is therefore very different from a civil trial or a criminal prosecution, which are adversarial. We will not make findings of civil or criminal liability. Assigning punishment is not the purpose of an inquiry. In fact, the orders in council explicitly prevent us from doing this. Another characteristic of public inquiries is that, is that unlike civil and criminal procedures, which focus on narrow issues between parties, public inquiries focus on broader systemic and institutional issues. It is also helpful to highlight the role of commission counsel, a function that is not always understood. They are lawyers who provide advice to the commissioners Commission counsel, like the commissioners, are objective and impartial. However, they report to and act under the direction of the commissioners. While today marks the first public proceeding of the commission, we have been fully engaged since receiving our mandate. Our first priority has been engaging with families of the deceased and with survivors. In addition, we have been hiring commission team, building our website, establishing our offices in Truro and Halifax, drafting rules of participation and funding, and developing a community engagement plan. All team members have been selected independently. The commission has been gathering and analyzing documents, conducting research, identifying witnesses and experts, and making preparations for public proceedings. We are committed to working in a respectful, transparent and independent way. We invite everyone to consult our website, which will be updated regularly and will provide timely information on the work of the commission. I would now like to speak briefly about our application process. The rules governing this application process were included in the call for participants and are posted on our website. With regard to funding requests by applicants, it is important to note that under our orders in council, we can only recommend funding for participants. It will be up to the clerk of the Privy Council to approve all funding in accordance with approved Treasury Board guidelines. Upon being granted the opportunity for appropriate participation, a participant agrees to adhere to the Commission's rules of practice and procedure. As noted, there will be a variety of ways to participate. These may include written or oral submissions on a particular issue, the opportunity to suggest witnesses to be called by commission counsel, the opportunity to make closing submissions in a proceeding, or the opportunity to participate in a community meeting or a policy roundtable. We would like to thank the many individuals and groups who applied for an opportunity to participate in the commission's work. We very much appreciate your interest in our public inquiry, which is of great importance to the people of Nova Scotia and to the entire country. It is also important to highlight that it is not necessary to have applied to be a participant in order to be involved in the commission's work. For example, members of the public may attend community engagement events and public proceedings. They may also follow our website, which will contain updated information on our work including rules of practice and procedures, various rulings, expert reports, and proceeding schedules. As noted earlier, our orders in council already prescribe an opportunity for appropriate participation to the Government of Canada, the Government of Nova Scotia, and the victims and the families of victims. While the orders in council refer to victims and families of victims, the Commission will generally use the more inclusive phrase, those most affected. Our present task is to grant an opportunity for appropriate participation to others 
with a substantial and direct interest in the subject matter of this inquiry. A substantial and direct interest is not defined in the orders in council or in any legislation that governs the Mass Casualty Commission. However, it is a concept frequently used in public inquiries to, deter to help determine which people and which groups will be permitted to formally participate in the inquiry process. Sometimes the term standing is used to describe this rule, but our orders in council instead refer to an opportunity for appropriate participation. We received applications for participation from a number of individuals and groups who expressed an interest in participating in all or part of the commission's work. In their applications, they explained their particular connection to the events of April 18th and 19th, 2020, or their experience and knowledge in the areas that relate to the commission's mandate. Nova Scotians, Canadians, and people around the world felt the impact of the April 18th and 19th, 2020 mass casualty. People continued to be affected by what happened and many will be watching the work of the commission closely. However, the commissioners are generally expected to provide individuals and groups with a substantial and direct interest with the opportunity to provide participation in the inquiry. For example, while witnesses have an important role to play in fact-finding work of the commission, they do not necessarily have a substantial and direct interest. Individuals and groups who have a genuine concern about the subject matter of the commission or who have an expertise in an area that will be considered by the commission may not have a substantial and direct interest in the subject matter of the inquiry. This does not mean, however, that they will not play a significant role in the work of the inquiry. Their participation in community engagement activities or through contributions to research and policy work will be of great assistance. Applicants who have demonstrated a continued interest and involvement or a significant expertise which form the substance of the Mass Casualty Commission's mandate may be able to meet the substantial and direct interest test, even if they were not involved in the events of April 18th and 19th, 2020. They may be invited to participate in appropriate ways in relation to issues where their contribution will help the commission fulfill its obligation to conduct a comprehensive public inquiry to determine what happened and to make recommendations to help Canadians in the future. This could include providing written submissions on particular aspects of the mandate, participating in policy roundtables or community engagement sessions, or giving expert testimony. I will now ask Commissioner Fitch to discuss the applications we received and the decisions we reached for each. Thank you, Commissioner McDonald, and hello, everyone. The April 2020 mass casualty visited unthinkable pain upon the families of those killed in their communities. It sent shockwaves throughout the province of Nova Scotia that reverberated throughout our entire country. The sheer magnitude of its repercussions prompts us to interpret substantial and direct interest broadly so that we may hear as many affected and interested voices as possible. At the same time, we have a very extensive mandate to fulfill in a limited period of time. The challenge therefore becomes one of promoting inclusiveness while honoring our time constraints. We will meet this challenge by A, finding creative, efficient and effective ways to engage participants and B, creating appropriate coalitions so that several participants with common interests they speak together regarding issues about which they have a particular interest or expertise. Coalitions also offer the advantage of creating balance and reducing duplication where various organizations have similar areas of expertise. In this decision, where we determine that an applicant is granted the opportunity for appropriate participation, we are satisfied that they have met the substantial and direct connection test. Commission Council will collaborate with all participants to determine the extent of their participation. 
the applicants fall into three general categories. A, those most affected. B, other individuals from whom we require more information. And C, group applicants. Those most affected are divided into three specific categories. The first is the families of the deceased. A number of people have applied to participate through their legal counsel. Based on their applications, we have identified these applicants as follows. The Bagley family, the Beaton family, the Blair family, the Bond family, the Campbell family, the Ellison family, the Goulet family, the Galinch and Madsen family, the Jenkins family, the McCulley family, the McLeod family, the O'Brien family, the Oliver Tuck family, the Thomas Zoll family, and Weber family. The second category is individual applicants. Individuals cur currently without counsel include Beverly Beaton, Tara Long, and Andrew McDonald. Individuals with counsel applied to participate through their legal counsel who listed them as follows. Lisa Banfield, Mallory Colpitz, Daryl Curry, Adam Fisher, Carol Fisher, Leon Jodry, Greg Muse, Bernie Murphy, and Deb Thibault. The participants I have just listed have an opportunity for appropriate participation by virtues of the Order and Council. We have also received applications from another 11 individuals listed in our full decision document. We very much appreciate the interest these 11 applicants have expressed in our commission. However, we require more information from them to better assess their potential contribution. We therefore invite them to provide a written submission with more details about how they propose to participate. In the category of group applicants, a number of groups and organizations applied for an opportunity to participate in the Commission's process based on their interest in various aspects of the mandate. They include some based in Nova Scotia and some based in other parts of the country. Some are grassroots organizations, while others are national in scope. In order to ensure an expeditious review of the issues in the mandate, while making the best use of government funding, we have grouped some applicants into coalitions. If these coalitions prove to be unworkable, we would be prepared to hear further from them. We have categorized these group applicants according to their purpose, focus, and characteristics as follows. Victim advocacy, health-related, firearms, justice, gender-based organizations, and police-related organizations. The applications from victim advocacy organizations include the Canadian Resource Centre for Victims of Crime, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police National Working Group Supporting Victims of Terrorism and Mass Violence, and the Office of the Federal Ombudsman for Victims of Crime. All three of these organizations are well-placed to assist the Commission as participants given their extensive experience in supporting victims of mass casualties. Furthermore, because of their common experience, they shall form a coalition to assist the Commission in understanding the relationships among police, government, and victims of mass casualties. The applications from health-related organizations include the Nova Scotia Nurses Union, the Nova Scotia Government and General Employees Union, and along the Shore Health Board. All three health-related organizations are well positioned to assist the Commission with its mandate. As on-the-ground community-based organizations with vast experience, they can contribute significantly with recommendations on how to keep our community safer and healthier. As participants, they may engage the Commission in a variety of ways, including preparing expert reports, attending community sessions, and participating in roundtable discussions. Given the importance of their respective contributions and the breadth of their membership, each may participate individually. 
We have received two applications from firearms organizations, including the Canadian Coalition for Gun Control and the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights. The use of firearms represents an important aspect of our mandate. These groups can continue to this work in an informative and balanced way. They are granted the right to participate on those aspects of our mandate dealing with the use of firearms. This can be done in a variety of ways, including providing expert reports and participating in expert roundtable decisions. The applications from justice organizations include the BC Civil Liberties Association, the East Coast Prison Justice Society, and Nova Scotia Legal Aid. The BC Civil Liberties Association and the East Coast Prison Justice Society are granted the opportunity to participate in the Commission's process as a coalition. Nova Scotia Legal Aid has the potential to make similar contributions, but from a unique perspective. It is therefore granted a separate opportunity to participate in the Commission's process. The gender-based organization applications include the Avalon Sexual Assault Center, Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, Feminists Fighting Femicide, Persons Against Non-State Torture, Women's Shelters Canada, Transition House Association of Nova Scotia, Be the Peace Institute, Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, and Wellness Within, an Organization for Health and Justice. All of the gender-based organizations who apply have a genuine concern about the subject matter of the commission or have an expertise in an area that will be considered by the commission. Their applications demonstrated a varying degree of ability to satisfy the threshold of a substantial and direct interest in the subject matter of the inquiry. Some of the organizations indicated they would be willing to form a coalition with others. We have taken these indications into account and make the following decisions. We direct that the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund and the Avalon Sexual Assault Center and Wellness Within form a coalition. Feminists fighting femicide and persons against non-state torture indicated a willingness to work together. We direct that they do so. We direct that the Women's Shelters Canada Transition House Association of Nova Scotia and Be the Peace Institute form a coalition. Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia is permitted to provide written submissions regarding the intimate partner violence, gender-based violence aspects of the mandate. Police related organizations include the Atlantic Police Association, the Canadian Police Association, the National Police Federation, Nova Scotia Chiefs of Police Association, RCMP Veterans Association of Nova Scotia, and the Truro Police Service. Policing in rural Nova Scotia is fundamental to our mandate. All six applicants can offer important perspectives in this regard. Many offer unique perspectives, and some were directly involved with this mass casualty. They bring national and local perspectives to our mandate. All six shall participate in the policing aspects of our mandate. While most organizations offer important unique perspectives, those of the Atlantic Police Association and the Police Association of Canada are sufficiently aligned to warrant a coalition which we direct. We express our thanks to all of the our, all of the applicants who took the time to apply for an opportunity to participate in the commission's process. I will now hand over to Commissioner Stanton who will speak about our next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fitch, and thank you everyone for joining us. I will briefly identify our next steps to assist the public in knowing what to expect in the coming months. At the outset, we must acknowledge the grim reality that has been and continues to be the COVID-19 pandemic. Since our orders in council on October 21st, 2020, COVID-19 cases have spiked twice in Nova Scotia, once in November and December, 2020, and now again in April and May, 2021. 
This has complicated our work, making it particularly difficult to plan next steps with certainty. Nonetheless, like everyone, we will remain agile and move forward with our mandate as best we can with the use of technology, personal protective equipment, and social distancing. Nova Scotians can rest assured that we will proceed with extreme care for everyone's health. Since the first weeks of our mandate, we have coordinated our work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Robert Strang, and his office. We will continue to do so, making sure that we fully understand and fully comply with all applicable protocols. Our most pressing priority is to determine exactly what happened on April 18th and 19th of last year. We recognize that those most affected and the public generally are looking for and deserve answers. To this end, our investigative and legal teams will continue to review thousands of documents, interview witnesses with the collaboration of our community liaison and mental health teams, and otherwise pursue this important part of the commission mandate. While many contingencies remain, in the coming months, we expect to continue our engagement with the individuals, organizations, and communities most affected. Our mandate requires us to make recommendations that could help protect communities in the future. This means that our work has a very important research and policy component, helping us to take the information gathered in the investigation and inform our ability to make meaningful recommendations. To this end, our research and policy team will review the factual record and relevant policies and procedures and with our direction, they will commission expert reports and conduct various roundtable proceedings with experts and community leaders. This work will be evidence-based and will be balanced so that all sides of the various issues are heard. This work has already begun and is integral to our proceedings. We are in the process of completing rules of practice and procedure in addition to those relating to this participation process, which have already been published on our website. Participants will have the opportunity to provide input on the draft rules before they are formally adopted and posted on our website. Following the issuance of this decision, Commission Council will engage participants on the parameters of their respective participation and the types of proceedings that will best accommodate their contribution to the mandate of the Mass Casualty Commission. Members of the public will have access to the public proceedings and transcripts of the evidence of witnesses who give public testimony. We would like to conclude by saying that it is an honor for us to have been selected to lead the Mass Casualty Commission. Each and every member of the Commission is deeply committed to fulfilling the important mandate of this independent public inquiry. We encourage you to continue to visit the Mass Casualty Commission website and social media channels. Please check in for updates or contact the Commission with questions. Thank you on behalf of Commissioners McDonald and Fitch, and take good care. <laughs>